In this lecture, I'll go over the rules and four examples for using proportional reasoning in physics. Proportional reasoning is a method we use to understand how the size of a value will change based on changes we make to variables in its equation. Proportional reasoning allows us to compare the size of different values, even if we do not know their actual number values. So we'll give you some examples of what that looks like in a moment. There are three steps to solving a proportional reasoning problem, which I'll introduce as we go through the first problem. In example one, a centripetal force F keeps an object of mass M moving with velocity V around a radius R. What centripetal force would be required to move the same object five times as fast around the same path? I'll start by writing the equation that I know for centripetal force. I know that that's equal to mass times velocity squared over R. And I'm going to call that force the original force. This is the force before we do anything different to the variables. So this is step one. I've written an equation for the original variable that will be affected by the change in the other variable. So the original variable that I'm worried about is the force, and I'm going to change the velocity and see how that affects the value of the force. Step number two says to write an equation for the new variable. So the new force is going to be equal to the same mass because it's the same object, and it's the same radius r because it's the same circular path, but we now have a new velocity. We're now dealing with 5v instead of v because we're trying to make the object move five times as fast. So because the velocity has to be squared and the new velocity is 5v, I have to make sure to square that full 5v in the equation. So that's step two, write an equation for the new variable. Step number three says to isolate the original function in the new function by factoring out any new numbers. My original function is mv squared over r, so I'm going to try to factor out any other numbers and just get a number times mv squared over r. And if I can do that, I'll know how big the new force is compared to the original force. So first thing I'll do is carry out this square, and when I do that I have to square both numbers in the parentheses so that 5 becomes 25. And because I'm trying to isolate mv squared over r, I'll bring 25 to the left of the fraction. I can now see that I have 25 times that original equation. I know that that's the same mass, same velocity, and same radius. I know it's the same velocity because I know that the new velocity was 5 times the original velocity, so that lowercase v stands for the original velocity. So because the original force is equal to that original equation, the new force I can see is equal to 25 times the original force. So that's the answer to the question. The centripetal force that would be required is a centripetal force equal to 25 times the force that we were using before to make the object move five times as fast. And that's how you do a proportional reasoning problem. I'll do one that's more complicated. A force of gravity F acts between two masses M1 and M2 with a distance R between them. If we triple the distance and double the mass m1, what would the mass of the second object need to be to make a force of gravity four times as strong as the original force? This is a really complicated question, and I have a lot of trouble visualizing this, and I find that students doing this for the first time assume that they're expected to just be able to think through this somehow. They're supposed to just have some clear idea of how all of these things relate to each other, but that's not true. That's not what you're expected to do. You're just expected to follow these three steps and isolate the variables. So step number one says to write an equation for the original variable that will be affected by the change in the other variable. And I know that the equation for gravity, the force of gravity that exists between two objects, is F equals G times M1 times M2 over R squared. And because I'm trying to understand how the second mass will change, I'm going to rearrange this equation to get M2 by itself. And I'll call that M2O for the original mass 2. Because I'm trying to understand what the new mass will look like compared to the old mass. So the old mass is equal to that original force of gravity times R squared over capital G over M1. Step two says to write an equation for the new variable. So the new mass two is going to be equal to four times the original force because that's what it says in the problem. And the new distance between them R is going to be three times that original R. So I'll just put three R where R would normally appear there and that's being squared. And the original mass one is being multiplied by two because again, the problem says that that mass doubles. So I get 4f times 3r squared over capital G times 2m1. That's going to be my new second mass. The final step is to isolate the original function in the new function by factoring out any new numbers. So I'm going to try to get all those new numbers to one side. When I square the 3 there, I get 9r squared. And when I bring those numbers to the side and multiply 4 times 9 and divide by 2, I get 18. So I'll keep that on the left. So that's 18 times capital F times r squared over capital G times m1. And I can see that the right part of that equation is equal to the original second mass. So that means that the new mass is equal to 18 times the old mass. 
So the new mass has to be 18 times the mass of the old mass. Example three says a car is driving down the road. If its kinetic energy triples, how much does its velocity increase by? The equation for kinetic energy is one half times mass times velocity squared. And if I rearrange that to find velocity by itself, I get that the original velocity is equal to the square root of two times the kinetic energy over the mass. So that's the original velocity that this object has. The new velocity is based on the same mass because it's the same car but its kinetic energy has tripled, so I'm going to need to get that three out of the equation. So I can see this is equal to two times three times the kinetic energy, and I still want that two, because that two appears in my original equation, so I'll only factor out the three. And when I do that, I get the square root of three times the square root of two times the kinetic energy over the mass, and these two things are the same, so that means that the new velocity is equal to the square root of three times the old velocity. Finally, in example four, a cart accelerates from rest down a hill. If we double the time that the cart moves for, what will happen to the displacement the cart covers? My kinematic equation for displacement, and I know that this car is starting from rest, so the initial velocity is going to equal zero. So the actual displacement of this cart is gonna be one half times the acceleration times the time squared. The new displacement is going to be one half times the acceleration times two times the time squared because we're doubling the time. So I want to isolate that original equation in the new equation. When I carry out that square, I get 1 half times a times 4t squared, which is equal to 4 times 1 half at squared, which is equal to 4 times the original displacement. So if you let something fall down a hill twice as long, it will travel 4 times as far. So as long as you're able to follow those steps, you'll be able to use proportional reasoning to understand the relationship between any two variables, even if you can't clearly visualize what's going on in the problem, and even if you don't have the exact number values of the variables themselves.